Oxidation and reduction reactions are often some of the most interesting reactions and fascinating reactions that my students will ever actually see done. I use the silvering process for the inside of bottles for my students in my advanced chemistry class right before they leave for holiday break in December. We, I let them bring in any glass bottle that they want to. I have actually a huge stockpile of 12 fluid ounce glass soft drink bottles that a student of mine who just loved a particular beverage had all of these bottles and just brought them in. So if a student forgets one, I have a reserve for them to work on. You can also do this with clean, unused laboratory glassware and give those to the students. But I find when they bring in their own bottle, they find it a little bit more interesting, a little bit more creative, and we have a lot more variations of what it creates. After the silvering process is done, it really is a wonderful thing that they can take home with them, and it's a lasting memory of something that they encountered in their chemistry class, which I find really meaningful and useful. I'm going to show you the process that I use in my classroom. I treat this as sort of an assembly line process, so I have four, I have a four long lab tables, or two long lab tables, two sides each, for a total of four aisles that I set up in my classroom when I have my students do this. And I have solution A, solution B, and solution C. And they go from one station to the other down the line and they silver their bottles. It's a really efficient process and doesn't take much class time at all. The old recipes that I saw for the silver mirror were really tedious and they all had to be made fresh because some of the reagents degraded over time. The recipe that you have in your handout is a much better recipe that I found that was given to me by a teacher who taught an AP workshop that I attended the first year before I started teaching AP chemistry. And this recipe can be stored on the solution, or stored in solution, on your shelf and brought out year after year after year. So I find this process a lot handy. It's much less set up for me. It takes some time to mix the solutions the first time, but then they keep for a very long period of time. I've already measured out 25 milliliters. I have a glass bottle here. When students bring in their own glass bottles, you probably want to mix them or rinse them with a dilute nitric acid solution to dissolve out anything that's on the inside. Rinse with plenty of deionized water. And then I usually do a final acetone rinse to make sure there's no oils or grease on the inside. And they usually get a pretty good mirror. It does need to be dry before they start. So you'll want them to bring in the glass bottles before you actually want to silver them so they can spend five or 10 minutes cleaning them or you can clean them yourself before they come in to clean them the next day. This is a fairly large bottle. This is much larger than 12 fluid ounces, so I'm going to be using 25 milliliters of solution. I usually have my kids use 10 milliliters each, but in this case, the larger volume needs a little bit more of the reagent. Uh, solution B has silver nitrate in it. Because it stains skin and clothing, I usually have my students wear gloves when they do this reaction, um, just so that they don't get the black marks on their skin. If they do get the black marks on their skin, it's not a huge deal. It's not permanent. You know, the skin will wear off over time. Um, but you can also have students uh, make sure that they wear the gloves so that they don't have that problem in the first place. So I'm just going to measure out solution B. And I label my pipettes, uh, every single one of them, because if any of these reagents contact each other, particularly if B and C come in contact or if they use the same one, you end up with silver graduated cylinders rather than silvered bottles. And um, while that might be pretty, it will also diminish the ability for you to use your graduated cylinder anymore. So I label the pipettes. I put out every station. I separate them by at least five feet. So the odds of transfer are very small. So I just need to pour out 25 milliliters of solution B. Well, that's darn good luck. All right. So I have 25 milliliters of each solution. And I'll set these down and clean that up later. Now, I also tell my students it's very important to go in order. Solution A goes in first. Solution B goes in second. And then solution C is the one that starts the reaction. So don't put in C until you're ready to go. So when we add solution C, we have to stop her and start shaking immediately. And they get this sort of icky brown color. And my students say, oh my god, it's not working. It's not silver. It's not silver. And I tell them, just keep moving it around. It's eventually going to happen. You have to be patient. But they get this sort of icky black brown stuff. And it starts getting darker. And like, it's not working. It's not working. Mine's ruined. It's going to be awful. Uh, and this has gone around the school. So the kids know when they take advanced chemistry that this is going to be happening right before holiday break. So they really actually look forward with a lot of anticipation to doing this activity. They actually sometimes ask me in the first 
week of school. Hey, are we going to do that this year too? Um, and so there's really a dramatic, beautiful reaction. So it just keeps happening. They get more and more impatient the longer they keep stirring the stuff around because they want that mirror to start forming. And the thing that's really fascinating is that they'll just be watching it. You need a lot of a particular atom before it starts demonstrating the properties of the bigger material. So you have to build up quite a bit of silver atoms on the surface of the glass before you start to see its reflective quality. And I do talk to my students about the history of silvering mirrors. It used to be that mirrors were just highly polished metal until we found this system that allowed us to deposit elemental silver on the inside of glass, which made far spectacularly beautiful mirrors, much higher quality than the polished metal did, because the polished metal can easily scratch, get damaged, or become dull over time. But they get a really beautiful thing that they can take home with them after it's finished silvering. It really is just sort of a magical thing, because students don't often see metals coming out of solution. Now, um, there's an important thing on safety and cleanup here. The residue that's in the inside of here cannot be left to dry. Um, there is the possibility of making an explosive form of silver. Uh, it's called fulminated silver. It's not actually silver fulminate, but a combination of silver and nitrogen compounds. Um, so what I usually do is have a waste beaker with lots of water in it. The only time that it has really become explosive over time is when it gets a little bit too concentrated. So I always pour out any residue that's from here and then rinse gently with deionized water. And I tell my kids that the wash bottle is actually a little bit too high pressure. You can actually flake off the interior silver. So what I have them do is actually take the cap off and just pour gently and sort of gently roll it around on the inside and tell them you want to cover the entire inside of the flask and just wipe out until you get all of that black chunky stuff out of the bottom and make sure it all gets in the waste beaker. Then I tell them that it needs to be dried very thoroughly when they get home after they've rinsed it really, really well. Silver will tarnish over time, so I tell them if they want it to last forever, they might want to take some clear nail polish or shellac and put it on the inside of it and roll it around the inside if they want to make sure that it never actually oxidizes or tarnishes. Now let me get a little bit on the cap here too. But after they've done the silvering process and they let it dry, they get a really beautiful momentum, memento of what's happened in their chemistry class. And I do talk to my kids. By this time, we've covered oxidation and reduction in the class. And I do cover how this is actually an oxidation reduction reaction. So I'm going to head to the board so we can look at those equations. In order for a material to be a reducing sugar, what we have inside that solution is regular sucrose. It's boiled with some other reagents. And the recipe is there, tartaric acid and so forth. What that does is actually breaks the sucrose molecule down and reveals an aldehyde group. So what's happening here, the Tollens test is what this is. And if you remember back to organic chemistry, if you had to take that course, aldehydes are things that can be changed through an oxidation reduction reaction. So if we have this under basic conditions, and solution C, all that is is really just sodium hydroxide. So the hydroxide ion reacts with, in the presence of the aldehyde. We're just setting up basic conditions for an acid base, or sorry, for an oxidation reduction reaction, not an acid base, an oxidation reduction reaction to happen here. This aldehyde can be turned into a carboxylic acid. Now, my students have had no organic chemistry at this point, so I give them these terms. This is an aldehyde, and this is a carboxylic acid. Well, the interesting thing is here, looking at oxidation states. And my kids know how to assign oxidation numbers, but R just stands for a big long carbon chain with some other stuff attached to it. So they don't know what's happening here, so I give them the oxidation state here. So this one, I'm going to actually switch to a different color because this is what I do in my class. Carbon is a plus 1 in terms of oxidation state in an aldehyde. But what happens? What's the difference between an aldehyde and a carboxylic acid? The only thing that's different here is we've added in more oxygen. Well, we know that my students know that in almost every single compound, oxygen's a minus 2. So if this is plus 1 and we've added in a minus 2 and the charge of our compound is still neutral, then this has to have gone up from plus 1 to plus 3. So we have an oxidation reaction here where we're increasing the oxidation number. That's what oxidation is. Well, my kids also know that oxidation is loss of electrons. So we have to have some electrons generated here. 
Well, if we went from plus two to plus three, how many electrons is that? Two. So there has to be two electrons released on this side of the equation. Now, in terms of balancing matter as well, I have two hydroxides here. The oxygen that inserts here is coming from a hydroxide. So the other thing that's left over, if you have two hydroxides, two hydrogens and two oxygens, the other thing we're left with here is some water. Now, if there's an oxidation, there has to be a reduction too. And that's where the silver comes into place. The silver is silver nitrate, and in the presence of that same solution is also some ammonium nitrate. So what happens when these two things are combined under basic conditions is you get what's called the Tollens reagent. It's a complex ion between ammonia and silver that has a plus one charge. Well, ammonia is a neutral substance, and this is just attaching to the silver ion. So silver is starting out as a plus one in terms of oxidation state. Well, what did we see after this reaction had happened? We saw elemental silver. And my students know that elemental means naturally occurring states. Those things are always in a zero oxidation state as they occur naturally in nature. Well, what's the difference between plus one and zero? We've gone down. So this has have taken up an electron in order to get to the zero state. This has lost an electron if it's a plus one. So we need an electron to be added in in order to get that reduction. If we're doing that, we also have released some ammonia. Now, I don't put a state of matter on the ammonia because honestly, some of it's aqueous and some of it's still gaseous, and you can smell when they open up that bottle, there is a little bit of an ammonia smell to it. So I tell them to take it. I keep that waste speaker in my fume hood operating, and so the ammonia vapors don't fill up the room too much. So they open it in the fume hood, dump all the stuff out, rinse and dump, and then they can take it back to their lab station. So there's not too much of an ammonia smell. Well, if we have two ammonias here, though, we need two ammonias here. And so now we can look at this oxidation reduction reaction and come up with a net reaction. We have two electrons up here, so we need to have two electrons here. If two electrons are reduced, two electrons have to be oxidized, so we have to transfer the same number of electrons. We have to balance by charge and by conservation of mass and matter. So I tell them that this reaction has to be doubled. We can add it up and get a net reaction. The net reaction is probably not going to fit on my board here, but they just add it together and the electrons end up canceling it out. But it is a nice demonstration of oxidation reduction reactions. My students really get a kick out of it and they get really proud of what they bring in. Sometimes they'll bring in colored glass bottles like Perrier, or sometimes you can get blue, blue glass or green glass. Um, sometimes they'll bring in root beer that comes in the brown glass bottles. Uh, they get all sorts of variations and they're very, very proud of the product that they get. It's a really nice take home gift that they can sort of have right before holiday time and something that's really an incentive for them when they come into the class. And it's a nice way to tie in some oxidation reduction to a nice history lesson about how we've gotten better mirrors. Thank you.